Lecture 2, on Ethics, Contemporary Moral Problems. Part 1 of Normative Ethics. 1. Utilitarianism, an introduction. As our text says, some things appear to be straightforwardly good for people. Winning the lottery, marrying your true love or securing a desired set of qualifications all seem to be examples of events that improve a person's life. As a normative ethical theory, utilitarianism suggests that we can decide what is morally right or morally wrong by weighing up which of our future possible actions promotes such goodness in our lives and the lives of people more generally. As well written as that is, it deserves some unpacking. Utilitarianism is described as a normative ethical theory. Normative, as a classification, refers to establishing norms, or standards, of how people ought to behave. Ethical, as we are using the term here, refers to moral, right and wrong, or good and evil. Theory refers to a systematic collection of ideas, not merely a hunch or singular idea, that is intended to explain something. Therefore, a normative ethical theory is a systematic collection of ideas that is intended to explain what is morally right, what is morally wrong, and how this knowledge ought to dictate our behavior. As explained briefly in the text, utilitarianism, as an ethical lens, can show us what is morally right and morally wrong by weighing, or deliberating about, what actions would create the most goodness for ourselves or for the greatest number of people. But more on this later, as it is best to begin with some background. 2. Hedonism is an ethical lens that purports to show us that what is good is determined entirely by the pleasure it produces or the pain that it avoids, nothing more. Therefore, a good life, on this view, is simply a pleasurable life. This theory is so straightforward there should be no surprise that it is a very early theory. Though it dates back to Epicurus, in ancient Greece, there are some modern varieties. For example, Fred Feldman espoused a view referred to as attitudinal hedonism, according to which, psychological pleasures can themselves count as intrinsically good for a person. But in its basic form, pleasure is good, and pain is bad, irrespective of the cause or context of the pleasure. Despite the intuitive elegance of this view, with a little imagination in thought experimentation, I'm sure you could come up with some difficulties that may arise by adopting this ethical lens. 3. Nozick's experience machine. One possible objection to the theory of hedonism stems from the common intuition that there is more to life than pleasure and the observation that sometimes the most worthwhile things are the most difficult, and even painful, yet bring goodness into our lives. An example of a down-to-earth thought experiment here could go as follows, imagine a person who hates exercise yet subjects themselves to it regularly. The hedonist would seem to be committed to the belief that this ascetic practice is intrinsically morally bad for the exercising individual. However, even though this practice is painful and grueling, the person knows that exercise will add years to their life, and life to their years, and determines that these painful experiences are intrinsically good. A more fanciful thought experiment, discussed in the text, was a matrix-like example deployed by Robert Nozick, which went as follows, suppose there was an experience machine that would give you any experience you desired. Superduper neuropsychologists could stimulate your brain so that you would think and feel you were writing a great novel, or making a friend, or reading an interesting book. All the time you would be floating in a tank, with electrodes attached to your brain. Should you plug into this machine for life, pre-programming your life experiences? Of course, while in the tank you won't know that you're there, you'll think that it's all actually happening would you plug in. Nozick's objection to hedonism rests on the intuition that people would not want to leave their real lives, friends, and families for this matrix-like simulation. The hedonist may attempt to write this of as not real pleasure, but that may be a difficult line of argument since the subject experiences it as real. But, more than likely, the hedonist would have to bite the bullet and admit that choosing the simulation is rationally the only moral course of action. 4. The Foundations of Bentham's Utilitarianism Jeremy Bentham was an early utilitarian who was inspired by hedonistic views. Bentham wrote, Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. Notice here that Bentham moves from an is claim to an ought claim. Reticulated, it could read, pleasure is felt, so we ought to pursue it, or pain is felt, so we ought to avoid it. 
Despite its fallaciousness, it is nevertheless intuitive. Bentham's ethical lens is supposed to show us that the good is that which, comparatively, brings about more pleasure and less pain. Notice here, that which makes something good on this view is determined by consequences, making it a, so-called, consequentialist view. Through this line of reasoning on pain and pleasure, Bentham establishes his conception of utility, by the principle of utility is meant that principle which approves or disapproves of every action whatsoever, according to the tendency which it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question, or, what is the same thing in other words, to promote or to oppose that happiness. From this conception of utility which is apparently reducible to pleasure, Bentham formulates not only the most commonly used definition for utilitarianism, but also what he considered to be his fundamental axiom. This definition is also what the utilitarian ethical lens is supposed to reveal when using it to evaluate moral problems, namely, what is morally good is that which produces the greatest good for the greatest number of people. 5. The structure of Bentham's utilitarianism. Our text outlines Bentham's utilitarianism as a hedonistic view that is, as we've briefly discussed, consequentialist, but also relativistic, maximizing, and impartial. Let's take these last three in turn. His view is relativistic, as opposed to absolutist. Consider this thought experiment the Nazis are looking for your friends, and you hold a relativistic conception of morality. You believe that lying is generally wrong but also that the moral characterization of a lie is relative to its context. In this context, the Nazis come to your door and ask if you know where they are and you lie, saving your friends' lives. This relativistic view would maintain that the act of lying in this context has a morally good characterization. Suppose a moral absolutist answered the door. The absolutist would not maintain that lying was ever morally permissible and would be committed to answering truthfully, dooming their friends. Next, Bentham's view is maximizing in that, if a course of action that promotes utility is chosen instead of another course of action that promotes greater utility, again, more good for more people, then the second course of action is the only morally permissible one. For example, feeding yourself and your partner on an expensive date may promote utility, but not as much as donating that money to a charity that would feed more people for the same cost. Lastly, the view is impartial. By this they mean it doesn't matter what the good is, or who makes up the greatest number of people benefiting from it. Therefore, this view cannot account for injustices experienced by minority, marginalized groups. For example, consider this thought experiment, there is a policy to be voted on for the reallocation of funds within a city. You are a member of a marginalized group that makes up 1% of the population and you could vote to have the funds allocated to programs promoting social justice and inclusion for your group or you could vote to have the funds allocated to programs of equal benefit to the other, comparatively privileged 99% of the population. As a utilitarian, you must blind yourself to the concepts of equity and social justice and vote to benefit the 99%. 6. Hedonic Calculus Bentham provides a methodology for moral decision-making. Hedonic calculus is a type of moral, or ethical, calculus which is a method of determining courses of action in morally perplexing situations in accordance with an ethical theory. Since Bentham's utilitarianism is hedonistic, hedonic calculus is used to assess potential pleasures according to 1. Their intensity. 2. Their duration. 3. The certainty that they will occur. Four how long they will persist into the future. 5. How likely that pleasure is to promote further related pleasures. 6. Whether or not that pleasure might cause or be accompanied by any pain. And 7. How many people may be able to experience that pleasure. Using these considerations in the utilitarian's moral calculus is intended to assist in decision-making that aligns with the ethical theory. 7. Problems with Bentham's utilitarianism. The first problem considered is the issue of comparing, so called, units of pleasure. Different pleasures of the same intensity may not be equal, that is, if different pleasures can even be said to have similar intensities. In short, there seems no clear way to measure pleasures against uniquely different pleasures when using hedonic calculus. The second problem is its inability to account for species chauvinism, 
Why wouldn't the pains and pleasures of animals factor into one's hedonic calculus? The third problem is the demand for maximization. It seems impractical to do everything in the most pleasurable way possible. Imagine always eating only the most delicious foods you know of, always getting a lift instead of walking, never clocking into work sober, and so on. Indeed, maximization is a tall order for maintaining moral propriety and avoiding immoral behavior. Another problem, alluded to earlier, is the tyranny of the majority. Recall the vote we considered earlier to explain impartiality. That would be an example of the tyranny of the majority. The example of the text illustrates how a larger country would be morally required to exploit smaller countries for their resources to facilitate the benefit of the larger country. Other problems discussed include the problem of considering consequences irrespective of intentions, the problem of partiality which prohibits the addition of extra moral weight given to the life of a loved one, and the objection that utilitarianism can lead to the compromise of a person's integrity. 8. Mill's Utilitarian Proof John Stuart Mill sought to refine and salvage Bentham's utilitarianism by reformulating it along with empirical proof of its conclusion that the greatest happiness at pleasure should always be secured for the greatest number of people. Mill justified this by claiming that happiness is the only thing that makes life any better. Mill claims that the things we pursue, such as knowledge, health, and freedom are only valuable in so far as they bring people happiness. Knowledge, for example, is only desired because it provides happiness when acquired, not because it makes life better in isolation. However, similar to Bentham, Mill also moves from fact to value, or is to ought, in his justification, which, of course, opens his position up to criticism. 9. Mill's qualitative utilitarianism, unlike Bentham, Mill is sensitive to the earlier discussed differences between pleasures. Whereas Bentham was only concerned with maximizing hedonically calculating quantities of total pleasure, Mill, following Aristotle, distinguishes between higher and lower order pleasures. According to Mill, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool, or the pig, is of a different opinion, it is only because they only know their own side of the question. This is an advantage over Bentham's conception of utilitarianism since Bentham could not admit that an unhappy Socrates could live a better life than a happy fool. But since Mill believes in quality of happiness over quantity of happiness, he can. The qualities of happiness that Aristotle discussed were those of lower, sensual fulfillment such as enjoyment of food and sex, which are available to, so-called, lower life forms or beasts, and those of higher, intellectual fulfillment such as art science, and philosophy, which are presumably only enjoyable to higher life forms. Expanding on Aristotle, Mill justifies this hierarchical ordering of pleasures by appealing to qualified authority, claiming that those who have experienced both lower and higher will prefer higher, thus ranking them higher, whereas the pig and the fool will prefer the lower since they don't know any better through lack of experience. However, arguments from authority can be inherently problematic. 10. Mill's Rule Utilitarianism versus Bentham's Act Utilitarianism, beyond the quality versus quantity of pleasures distinction, Mill's view would further come to distinguish itself from Bentham's by reference to rule versus act utilitarianism. With Mill typically considered a rule utilitarian and Bentham an act utilitarian. By act utilitarianism, we mean that the operative theory of the ethical lens only enables us to focus on the consequences of individual actions in moral decision making. This limitation led to such objections as Judith Jarvis Thompson's problem of the transplant surgeon. Consider Thompson's thought experiment, imagine a case where a doctor had five patients requiring new organs to stop their death and one healthy patient undergoing a routine check. In this case, it would seem that total pleasure is best promoted by killing the one healthy patient, harvesting his organs and saving the other five lives, their pleasure outweighs the cost to the formerly healthy patient. Even though Bentham's sixth criterion of purity in hedonic calculus is intended to account for such cases, it is not immediately clear that the surgeon isn't morally required to sacrifice the healthy patient for the good of the five unhealthy patients. Contrarily, Mill's rule utilitarianism is better equipped to handle such objections. From the rule-based view, 
it is easy to see that rules requiring the slaughter of healthy patients entering hospitals for the sake of unhealthy ones would diminish the maximization of total happiness since it could dissuade the general public from ever consulting their doctors, decreasing the overall health and life expectancy of the population overall. 11. Strong versus Weak Rule Utilitarianism Mill's rule utilitarianism seems to result in two competing tenets when subjected to analysis, namely, strong and weak rule utilitarianism. Consider first strong rule utilitarianism which can be articulated as follows, guidance from the set of rules that, if followed, would promote the greatest amount of total happiness must always be followed. As opposed to weak rule utilitarianism which dictates that, guidance from the set of rules that, if followed, would promote the greatest amount of total happiness can be ignored in circumstances where more happiness would be produced by breaking the rule. The dilemma resulting from the strong weak rule distinction is that, on the strong version, rules replace the core principles that make the view utilitarian, and, on the weak version, the view is once again open to the objections to act utilitarianism, the very objections that rule utilitarianism was intended to avoid. 12. Comparing the classical utilitarians, while both Bentham and Mill are hedonistic theorists, let us briefly outline their theoretical differences. For Bentham, all pleasures are equally valuable, he is an act utilitarian, and his view is teleological, impartial, relativistic, and maximizing. On Mill's view, quality of pleasure matters, specifically, intellectual pleasures are superior to animalistic pleasures. Mill is viewed as a rule utilitarian. If Mill is a strong rule utilitarian, then it is not clear if his view is teleological or relativistic. Finally, Mill's view may only constitute an impartial and maximizing theory. 13. Non-hedonistic contemporary utilitarianism, Peter Singer and preference utilitarianism, the rising along utilitarian lines has continued to the present day. The utilitarian torch was handed to Henry Sidgwick after Mill and R. M. Hare was a notable advocate in the 20th century. Currently, Peter Singer advances a non-hedonistic, preference utilitarianism. By non-hedonistic, we mean that the good is not reducible to mere pleasure. Otherwise, Singer's view carries many of the same hallmarks as Bentham's, except Singer believes that what improves a person's life is entirely determined by the satisfaction of their preferences. If you satisfy a preference to achieve something, then your life improves in virtue of having satisfied that preference. In apparent agreement with Bentham, Singer argues that the individual ought to be at the core of moral thinking. According to Singer, there would be something incoherent about living a life where the conclusions you came to in ethics did not make any difference to your life. It would make it an academic exercise. The whole point about doing ethics is to think about the way to live. My life has a kind of harmony between my ideas and the way I live. It would be highly discordant if that was not the case. Since Singer's view is otherwise similar to Bentham's, his view is open to similar objections. Namely, regarding circumstances where partiality seems desirable, or when the preferences of the majority seem to threaten a minority group, or require us to sacrifice our integrity. 14. Summary Utilitarianism remains a living theory and retains hedonistic and non-hedonistic advocates, as well as supporters of both act and rule formulations. The core insight that consequences matter gives the theory some intuitive support even in the light of hypothetical cases that pose serious problems for utilitarians. The extent to which the different versions of utilitarianism survive their objections is very much up to you as a critically minded philosopher to decide. 15. Questions and Tasks Though there are 12 questions listed in the Issues to Consider section, at least answer these four before next time. 1. Is there anything that would improve your life that cannot be reduced to either pleasure or preference satisfaction? 2. Would you enter Nozick's experience machine if you knew you would not come out? Would you put someone you care about into the machine while they were asleep, so that they never had to make the decision? 3. Are you ever told to stop watching television, or stop any other type of screen time, and do something else? Is this good for you? Why? 4. If your preferences change after psychotherapy, did the original preferences ever matter? Before we conclude, let us try to imagine what using this ethical lens might look like and what the lens reveals when we use it to examine moral problems.
consider this oversimplified schematic. First, we identify a moral problem, then we evaluate our options through the lens of the ethical theory we are considering, finally, we hypothetically act and reflect on the consequences. Consider this classic thought experiment. There is a trolley on a track that splits in two and there are six people tied to the tracks with five on one side of the split and one on the other. The trolley is currently approaching the five people on the track and has no time to stop. You could pull a lever next to you to divert the trolley to the track with only one person tied down. What do you do? If we evaluate our option through the ethical lens of utilitarianism, we will see that what is morally required is pulling the lever, since we are concerned with the greatest good for the greatest number of people, life being the good, and five people being more that one, this ethical lens shows us that pulling the lever is morally required. This makes intuitive sense at first, however. If the single person tied to the tracks was a family member or loved one, it is not clear that extra moral weight shouldn't be afforded to them in your moral imperative. Utilitarianism, while still in theoretical circulation and development, at least now, seems to be as meritorious as it is problematic. But consider using this utilitarian moral lens and calculus to examine other contemporary moral problems that are important to you. For example, would a total ban on abortion produce the greatest good for the greatest number of people? What can you do about that? Or, what if the entire world moved to an entirely vegetarian diet? What would that look like through a utilitarian ethical lens? Would it be sustainable? What are the further consequences of either of these speculations?